Hello everyone, today we are excited to be launching the series of health focused webinars for the Northwest Health and Wellness Camp. And I'm very honored to be speaking today with Dr. Nitha Tiagi Jane, who is a pediatrician at the Snoqualmie Valley Clinic. And besides being a pediatrician, Dr. Jane is an amazing advocate for kids' physical and mental health, and she is heavily invested in community outreach. Thank you so much, Dr. Jane, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me here. It's just an honor to be in this forum and to be talking to such an amazing person like you, Meher. Um, and a Merry Christmas to everybody who's uh, listening to us. Today's 25th as we are recording this. Yes, thank you so much. And Merry Christmas to everyone watching as well. So Dr. Jane, please tell us a little bit about your practice, your specialization, and the spectrum of patients that you see. Um, so I, as you just mentioned, I'm a general pediatrician. So uh, what, what that entails is that I take care of the kids right from the time that they are born to they are 18 years of old. And so um, all my practice entails in taking care of them, um, doing their physicals, making sure that they are growing well, and then um, talking to the parents so that we can keep them on a good, healthy path, both physically and mentally. And then, you know, um, just doing a lot of work with the children, listening to them, addressing their needs. Um, generally, that is what the general pediatrics is all about. And when they fall sick, then they I, and then they come to me and I take care of them. Uh, sickness like, you know, fever, ear infections, throat infections. So it's a general, um, it's a whole um, big conundrum of taking care of all their, uh, their good well child needs and their sick needs. Wow, that sounds very amazing to see how you take care of kids um, from the moment they're born. And as I mentioned before, Dr. Jane is an amazing advocate for uh, kids' physical and mental health. So it's great to hear how you're involved in that as well. So what was the reason that you chose pediatrics as your field? <laughs> you know, it was very uh, strange because when I... I started, um, I did my uh, medical education in India, where I was born. And so initially when I did my education, when I started, went into residency, I was an OBGYN. And so I used to deliver the babies. And I remember at that time when I used to deliver the babies, I used to be so much more enamored with the babies I used to deliver. So I used to, without, you know, waiting for the neonatologist to come i could i was able to resuscitate them i was able to pacify them when they were little and so then i started thinking maybe i should do pediatrics because i love children so much i just i was so always uh, astounded with a new life into the world and how that life would shape up and everything and so i think when i uh, came to united states i automatically just did pediatric residency and that's how i started um, doing pediatrics because for me it was so it was so amazing just to see that baby who was little tiny to born with and grew up and became this amazing individual. So the whole journey was very important for my brain. So I think that's why I became a pediatrician. Dr. Jane, what are some of the challenges of practicing pediatrics? I think for me, the biggest challenge of, of uh, uh, practicing pediatrics is I'm taking care of most of the time, I'm taking care of number one babies who cannot talk, right? Who cannot tell you what's happening like a, like a baby till their baby is a year old, cannot tell you what's happening. If the baby is hurting, if the baby is hungry, if the baby is hot, cold, they can't tell you. So this is like an enigma for me. How can I understand just by seeing the body language of the child what the child needs and how can I teach the parents to you know understand the child then as the children grow up a lot of times you know you remember you know this you are a kid that sometimes when um, we go through a lot of emotions we 
don't tell our parents or we don't express any, anything uh, to anybody, but we start behaving in different ways. And so for me, that was a challenge. How can I help these kids before they actually start hurting so much to help them that they don't go there, that they don't hurt themselves? And how can I make other people around them understand what they are going through so that they can get all the help they want? So I think that is my biggest challenge of uh, practicing pediatrics. It's great to hear how you work with kids and also how that can sometimes be a challenge as well, because uh, from the moment kids are born, each stage really presents its own challenges. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. What are some suggestions that you would like to give to new parents and to those with infants? So I think the biggest thing I want to tell the new parents is that um, love your child. Love your child as much as you can, but don't spoil them. So there's a very fine line. Always be attentive to your child. So when the child needs, uh, needs something like, you know, the child cries, needs something, make sure that you are there. But every time a child starts whining or crying, you don't have to worry about it because the children are very resilient people and they will make you understand what is it that they want. So listen to your child, number one. That is what I will say. And then let the children be so that sometimes you don't always have to entertain your children because they can entertain themselves. And so teach them from the very beginning to be comfortable with themselves, because if they are comfortable with themselves, they will grow up to be strong individuals because they know that they don't have to be entertained all the time. They actually can do a lot of things by themselves and don't be scared. Don't be scared that you're going to hurt your child or by saying no to your child, you're going to emotionally hurt the children. Because no, you can't. The children love you so much and you basically love the children so much that you can't hurt them. So um, be confident in raising your children because if you are confident in raising them, they will grow up as confident people. And I know that one of your interests is child development as well. So please tell us a little bit about some of the things parents of elementary age kids should be mindful of in terms of development. That's a, such a fantastic question because you know, elementary school is the time of, um, as I say, laying the foundation for your life to go. Because in elementary school, you learn to interact with other people. You learn to form your own personality. You learn to uh, understand your boundaries and you learn to become mindful, respectful, and be kind to other people because now you are interacting with different people, right? So um, the, what the parents can do for your children is number one, make them independent. Right from the age of five year, a child can dress themselves, they can tie their own shoes, they can eat food by themselves, and they can help you a little bit in the chores at home. So make your children independent. Second thing is teach them to respect themselves and to respect people around them. What do you mean by that? By, by respecting themselves, like teach them that if they don't like anything, learn to say no. Learn to tell somebody, I am not liking this, I'm hurting. And similarly, to treat the other person also like that. Don't, don't bully the other person. Don't be mean to the other people because just you, you can be mean to the other person and think good about yourself. But no, in the long run, you're going to hurt yourself and you're going to hurt the other person because nobody is friends to the mean people. And you cannot be without any friends in the elementary school. And the third thing is, let the children help you in their chores in the house, because when they help you in the chores by themselves, they feel very confident. They feel that, yes, they accomplished this thing. They did this thing by themselves and praise them. Don't over praise them, but praise them for the things that they do, because, you know, when the children do some things, it's a big thing for them. Like suppose you, you get up in the morning and you brush your own teeth and you have your own breakfast and you sit down for your own um, these days because you are doing online schooling. That's a big thing for your children. So praise them and say, I'm very proud of what you're doing by yourself. You are so young, but you are able to accomplish things by yourself. And I'm extremely proud for yourself. So I think those are the foundations that you want to lay in the elementary school for the children. 
Well, that's really great advice, especially for parents and people who are taking care of kids to know that there's so many skills that they need to develop at a young age and just to encourage them to build those skills. Yeah. So screen time is always such a topic of debate amongst parents and kids, especially now everything's online and many parents are feeling a bit uneasy about that. So what would be your advice about allowable screen time for kids of different age groups and how much time outside would you recommend? Okay, so I want to talk to you about what the American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines are. So according to the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines, under the age of two years, there is actually no need for television. There's no need for any media. There's no need for television because that is the time that you are developing your brain, you're developing your uh, social skills, and you're developing your um, language. And if you are put in front of the screen, you are not going to develop those languages skills so nicely. So under the age of two years, there's no need for any television. Between the three to five years, not more than one hour every day. And you can divide that one hour. You can do 15 minute slots or you can do half an hour slot, but not more than one hour. From um, five years onwards, not more than two hours. And this is two hours of things that you do for leisure. Because now everybody is on the um, screen for education, we don't want to take that into consideration because there's no, there is no point of saying, oh, you can be only for two hours because the children are on the screen for five to six hours for the school. So these, these guidelines that I'm talking about, these are beyond what you do for your school, right? They also say that, if I give you the data, for example, they say that between six to 10 year olds, they spend almost eight hours on the screen right now. From 11 years to 15 years, you're spending around nine hours on the screen. And this is not doing homework. This is just random time. And from 15 year onwards, you're spending seven and a half hours doing your you know, phone or gadgets or video games and all. So these are the things. For, for screen time also, the, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics says that even if the children are watching that one or two hours of screen, be with your kids so that you can talk to them in between because you know you can uh, use the screen time as a learning tool for your children. You can sit down with them, you can explain what is happening on the screen so that you are interacting with, during that time also. So those are the guidelines for watching the screen time. But a lot of parents are very worried, oh, what's going to happen to my kids' eyes and all. So let them let them take rest in between the screen time. Like they don't have any choice. They are working on the, on the schoolwork, on the screen time. So give them uh, break time in between. Like for, for every 20 minutes that they are on the screen, let them have a five-minute break or 10 minutes break of the, of the, outside of the screen time. So this is how you can balance between your screen time and your, your school time now. Okay, thank you so much. Just great advice for parents, especially it's been a, such a huge challenge for parents and for kids to balance the amount of screen time that kids are getting. So I think this is great advice for that. So for teens, kids my age, what are some of the developmental milestones that we should know? So for, I want to talk about these developmental milestones from 12 years, because 12 years is your preteen year. That is your, that is your threshold of entering into the teen house, as I call it, right? So we start from 12 years and we take you till 17 or 18 years till you are mature. Basically around 12 years, a lot of body changes are happening. The girls and boys both are growing up. You are entering your puberty, you are growing up. The girls are maturing, their bodies are changing. A lot of you will start having your periods. And so emotionally and physically, you are in a very uh, tumultuous situation. You are going through so much emotions on your own. Some of the children are very comfortable in their body. Some of the children are not comfortable in their body. So it's very difficult. It's very exhausting, as I might say, and it's very stressful for some of the children. So that is one of them. This is also the time that, you know, in the school, you will see um, 
the friendships are changing every day. One day this person will be your best friend, the second day that person will not want to talk to you. It's not to do anything with you. So don't think that, oh, it must be something wrong with me. These are normal changes because everybody is going through these changes. And so these are some things. And this age is also the time that a lot of emotional changes happen. Because remember, in your teenage years, the amygdala is bigger than your frontal cortex. So what does that mean is amygdala is a seat of impulsivity. Oh my God, let's just do it, right? That you don't think about it. Let's just go out. It doesn't matter whether it's cold outside, it's raining outside, we'll just go. Because for you, it's like you're not reasoning because the, the body is not made up like that. So you don't reason, you do things. This is also the time of a lot of emotional maturity. So the children are going through a lot of emotional changes. They are hormonal changes. So one, so they, they start become very angry. They start becoming very aggressive. They are more into peers. They don't like talking to their parents a lot. So those are the changes that are going through. Some of the children, and I'm not going to say all of them, some of the children start experimenting with drugs, with alcohol, with sexual tendencies. So those are some of the things that are happening to children who are in the teenage groups. Okay, thanks. This gives us a really great overview of the different milestones that teenagers, uh, especially teenagers like teenage girls like me should be aware of in their journey and I know that there's a lot going on and it's a lot more for them to deal with during this time it's been difficult and stressful for everyone so Dr. Jane please talk a little bit about menstrual health and hygiene for teen girls Fantastic topic. I'm so proud of you for asking this. So we are talking a lot about respecting your own body, right? Because if you respect your own body, if you know what to expect from your own body, you will be able to grow up into a very confident individual. And we need the, the young people who are going to be the leaders for tomorrow to be confident and um, informed people. And so let's talk about the mental uh, menstrual health of the um, girls. Most of the girls are experiencing menarche, as we call the starting of menstrual cycle very early. I have uh, kids who I see at the age of nine and 10 who are starting their periods. At nine and 10, you, are, you don't understand what is happening to you. But remember that this is very normal. This is the normal process of the body because starting menarche or, or starting your menstrual cycle is a very normal uh, period of the body. Every girl goes through it. Okay, so there's nothing to, number one, there's nothing to worry about it. There's nothing to think that, oh, I'm sick and what is going to happen to me. The, the big thing is learn to use the proper tools so that you can take care of yourself. If you want to use a tampon, it's perfectly fine because a lot of you girls do um, sports, you, you swim, you do water polo, you're running. So um, a tampon works. Learn to use the tampon properly. And you can always take uh, help of um, your mother if she uses. You, if you have an elder sibling, you can use that. If you don't have an elder sibling, then talk to your uh, doctor so she can make you understand how to use it. The second thing is clean, keep yourself clean because you know how we are like, oh, I get lazy, I won't take a shower. But remember, when you are having your period, especially, take a shower every single day and clean yourself well. Because if you don't clean yourself well, this is dirty blood which is going out of your body, right? This is something which is not needed. And so if you don't clean yourself well, you can catch urinary tract infection during this time because the body is the, the pH of the body is different around this time. And drink a lot of water. Drink a lot of water so that you can keep yourself well hydrated. You don't feel dizzy. You don't feel sick. Eat very uh, good food. So by good food, I mean eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. You have good protein diet so that, you know, you can keep yourself well. Some of the girls or some of the kids do get cramps in the body. So make sure that you are drinking a lot of water and decreasing your salt intake so that you don't have so much cramps. So these are some of the things that you can do for your menstrual health. Yeah, I think this is a very important topic to touch on and one that doesn't get talked about as much. So I think it's really important for girls to know about this. 
Yes. And, and I'm very happy that you're talking about this because, you know, I feel more and more girls, if they know right from the very beginning what to expect, then they don't get so scared about it. And they don't get so worried about it. So um, be informed, but don't be worried about it. Another topic that I really wanted to talk about was the emotional health of teens. And I know that during teenage years, it's a time when there's a lot going on for everyone and it can be very hard for teenagers to get through uh, this very difficult time and other teenage years and this can really affect their emotional health which has been like further exacerbated by this situation that we're all in it's been a very stressful and difficult time so i it feels like a lot of times we're on a roller coaster of emotions. Please talk a little bit about that. What's a good way for teens to express themselves when they're angry? Because I know that this is something that many teens really struggle with. That is so nice that we are talking about this because this is the time from March. I think the more stress we want to put on is the emotional and mental health, especially of the teenagers. Why I say this is that teenage years are the years of social interaction, right? You go to school not only to get knowledge, but to interact socially with your other friends. And um, I'll talk a little bit about this time because around this time, everybody is isolated. We are all doing Zoom uh, schools. We are all doing team meets. So we are not interacting socially with everybody else. I mean, if you, even if we are doing Zoom meets, you can't, you can't feel how the other person is. You can just see their faces and you're like, oh yeah, I see you, you are okay. But, but till you don't sit near that person, till you don't talk to them, till you don't actually interact with them, you don't get that social interaction. And so these, time, these days, all the teens are struggling because of that. And so, um, of course, they are very angry, they are very um, depressed, they are very anxious because what's going to happen? And teenage years normally are years of a lot of anxiety, a lot of um, depression, a lot of, um, um, I don't know what I'm, I'm expected to do. And if I'm not, if I don't know what I'm expected to do or my expectations are so much, I can't control it and I get very angry. We get angry because we are scared, because we are anxious, because we are uncertain of what is happening around us and because we don't know how to express ourselves completely. And we don't know if we express ourselves, how is the other person going to react to it? Okay. So number one thing I will always say is, communicate, talk. It doesn't matter whether, um, how much you talk, but talk, talk to your parents or talk to your older siblings or talk to your other friends that you have. Or if you don't have anybody to talk to, talk to, tell your parents, I want to talk to a counselor because counselor is not a taboo. It is just another person who you can talk to without feeling any vindication. Because, you know, a counselor is like neutral person. He will just listen to you. So those are the things that I want to talk to you. You are angry. Of course, you are angry because anger is a normal emotion of humanity as it is. And during your, your teenage years, you become more angry because you are, teenagers think that they are very mature. They can do things by themselves. But in the mind of parents, you guys are still babies, right? So a lot of parents will not let you do a lot of things because they're like, how can you do this? You are still a kid. But in the, parent, in the teenage mind, they can do everything because now they've grown up. And so that is the big mismatch which happens. And that is why most of the teenagers become very angry because they are not allowed or they don't have the um, independence to do what they want to do. Right. So this is number one thing. So talk to your parents and have a game plan. As I say, have a plan. What is it that I'm allowed to do? And what is it that I'm not allowed to do? What is it that I can? How much am I allowed to do? And how much do you guys not let me do? What are your expectations from me? So that if you know what are the parents expecting out of you, you will not have so much anger. You will not because you will know I'm allowed to do so much. So I will do it. The second thing is that 
try to get the information of what is happening more from a person who is a little bit older than you if you try to get information more from your friends you feel like no i don't need any older in my life i can do it with my friends remember your friends are also in the same boat as you are they they are also 12 and 13 they have never been 16 17 18 so they don't know what is happening at 16 17 and 18 years they only know what is happening at 12 13 years so the information that they give you are their own perspective so always have somebody who you feel um safe with can talk to so that you know you when you are getting angry or when you are feeling really overwhelmed you can go to that person and one big thing i will always say is that if you are thinking that you are starting to feel angry or you are starting to feel overwhelmed tell your parents i am sorry i am very angry right now let me go away i'll cool down in my own room and then when i am a little bit better i'll come back and talk to you because when you are angry and the moment and the emotions that you express they don't help anyone so that is something that you can do when you are really angry Okay, yes, thank you. I feel like this is a very relevant topic today and it's becoming more relevant than ever. So many teens feel like there's so much that they don't have control over with further restrictions from people who are not their parents. <laughs> That's true. Very true. So tell them that you know what? I understand that you mean the best for me, but you know what? this is what i would like to do and i would like to discuss it with my parents so that i can understand what my family values are and i can work within those things so it's it's a good way of telling the other person thank you very much for your concern but i would like to work with my parents right so that you know the other person of course you know it's very easy to give advice very easy to give advice but it's important for teenagers to understand what works for them and what doesn't work for them right yes it is definitely a balancing act between what teenagers want to do and what the parents their parents want them to do so i think it was really good by you gave really great advice on how teens can really focus on balancing it out And the next question also relates to mental health with the pandemic and with social isolation. It also seems like there's a mental health pandemic as well. I know that's something that people have been talking about a lot lately. So please tell us what you are seeing in your practice and what we should be mindful of. What are also some of the resources available to support um, especially teenagers? who are uh, who um have their mental health really affected by this time so i think in my practice the many things that i'm seeing are that i have teenagers who are very anxious some of the teenagers are feeling um lot stressful and um the lot of teenagers are not able to focus on their um school work because online is not working for them so they don't feel very motivated they are not finishing their work and they are having clashes with their family because they are always inside many teenagers are not leaving their rooms they are not getting up from their bed they are not uh, going on to their school work because they just don't feel like doing anything a lot of the teenagers are feeling suicidal because they feel like they are so depressed that life is not worth living because they don't have any goals in their life and they are lot of for lot of people their family situation is not the best as it is and the pandemic has made it much worse because their parents are also sad lot of parents have lost their uh, livelihood so they are very stressful about how to um, put food on their table how to um, you know get things for the children how to pay their mortgages so that is also working and so the children are feeling the brunt of it because they are not able to go out they are not able to let out their emotions they are not able to blow off the steam which is happening and and so they are very very um, stressful and they are very scared of what is going to happen um going forward because nobody knows what is going to happen tomorrow because of this pandemic so those are some of the things that are help me um washington actually has a great resource for all the children and for our, everybody uh, i would say there are crisis connections which cover the king county 
There are teen links. The Washington Resource Helpline is there. Then the Washington 211 is a it's a regular information center for everybody. And there are Volunteers of America and Crisis Response a Series. It's a 24 hours emotional support. You can get into the emotional support and you can uh, get social help also through them. And then there is the Natural Suicide Prevention Lifeline. It's a crisis text line. There's King County Public Behavioral Health Services. And then the big is NAMI. NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And they have a 24 hour by seven number where you can talk to somebody. And even if you are feeling stressful, reach out. The one thing which I will always say is that if you are feeling stressful, if you are feeling sad, if you don't have any motivation, reach out. Tell your parent, I don't want to do this. I want help. And so that you can get some kind of help with before you hurt yourself and before you become so isolated that it becomes very difficult for you to start functioning day to day. So those are some things that I would like to talk about at this time. And mental health can also be a topic that is hard for many teens to bring up because many... Um, Teenagers my age are really afraid of what's going to happen if they try to reach out for help. And many of them might feel embarrassed to reach out for help or just ashamed. And so they end up keeping all their emotions inside and possibly hurting themselves. So it's great to know that there are these resources available and that there are places teens can go if they need help. Yeah, and Meher, I want to say this, you don't, if you are in crisis, you can make your call by yourself. You don't have to ask a parent to make these calls because these are your calls. When you are a teen, you can reach out for mental health by yourself because it is very important that if you are hurting, you reach out. Because like you said, a lot of times the teens will not talk because they think that this mental health is a taboo. But I want to tell you this, this is the time that mental health is not a taboo. If you are hurting, reach out. Reach out to anybody. Reach out to these crisis lines that I talked about because you, you don't have to suffer and there is nothing to be ashamed of. If you have a sore throat, won't you go to the doctor to get medicine? Yes, you will. So similarly, think about it like this and reach out to somebody so that you know you can get the relevant help. And most people, actually everyone, has probably during this time seen a time when they needed help. So it's good for teens to know that they're not alone. Yes, oh my God, no, you're not alone. Everybody is suffering right now. You guys are suffering more because kids are supposed to interact and you guys are not getting that chance to interact. And that's the reason why. So don't think that you are alone. Don't think that, oh my God, how are my friends so happy and how am I like that? No, everybody is going through it. Some are going through, some show at one, some show at 10. That's it. That's all there is. So that's what is happening. So what are some of the practical things that kids can do in their lives today in terms of mindfulness or exercise to help them when they are feeling stressed? So a couple of things I want to say. Number one, sleep well. Have a good sleep schedule. Because a lot of you guys, what you do is after the school, after the homework is done, you get onto your computers, you are playing video games, or you're chatting with the other friends till two or three o'clock in the morning. And that is uh, that is, go is really bad because the teenagers have a as I call a melatonin surge. So melatonins are the, um, they are some of the chemicals which are released in the body, which cause you to sleep better. The children are of your age, like the teenagers, they have the melatonin surge around 11 o'clock. So if you're not in bed by 10 or 11, you don't catch that and you don't have a restful sleep. So all your emotional things will start with a good restful sleep. So sleep very well. Sleep at least uh, seven to eight hours every night. That is so very important. Second thing is eat well. Eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. Eat food which is rich in protein and vitamins because remember, you're not getting so much activity as you would normally get. So you want to eat well so that you can keep your body healthy. Third thing, no matter what happened, have at least an hour of physical activity. 
if you if it's cold outside if it's raining outside you can go up and down the stairs in your house if you don't have house just go around the house couple of times so that you know you can get some kind of physical activity if it's a good day outside go outside for a walk go outside for a walk run bicycle whatever you guys like to do but do something physically for yourself and then the third the uh, fifth thing and the most important thing is don't be on the media for a long time because remember you are studying on the computer for five six hours every day so don't spend too much time in front of the computer come out have at least a dinner or a lunch meal with the rest of your family come outside and spend some time with them so that you know you can get your mind out of where you are this will help you we talk a little bit about mindfulness mindfulness is nothing but it's a controlled breathing activity so if you want every day in the morning and evening take 10 or 10 deep breaths and like this take 10 deep breaths in the morning 10 deep breaths in the evening what you're doing is by deep controlled breathing you're settling your mind you are increasing the oxygenation in your body so that you feel less stressful you feel a little bit better so you can do these things and dr jane also one thing that we often hear as teens is that our brains are still being shaped and our brains are still growing and that we as teens lack executive functioning. What is it and what can we do? I don't think you teens lack executive functioning. Some of you teens are amazing. You guys are amazing organizers. You are amazing thinkers. You are great um, debaters. You are great writers. Look at yourself, right? The point is, like I said, mentioned before, because the amygdala is a little bit bigger in size than the frontal cortex, and frontal cortex is a seat of thinking, is your seat of reasoning, is your seat of organization. And that's why all the teens are, as I call them, unorganized, chaotic unorganized, because of the way you guys are. But what I want to say is that, Every day in the morning, write down, make a plan for your whole day that this is what I have to do today. And then prioritize things which are important for you, finish them first. And then every day, definitely take a little time for leisure, time for only yourself to do things that make you feel happy because that way you will be able to put things into place much better. Think for yourself and for the community around you. Always think for the community around you because when you start thinking, you will be able to do more things. You will be able to organize things a little bit better. Those are executive functions, functions which are important for your day-to-day -day life and which for you guys are studies, doing some kind of um, voluntary work and helping your parents in the house. That is also voluntary work. And, you know, just... Uh, interacting more with your friends because you want to keep up your social interaction also. So these are executive functions. Start with making a list. When you start making a list, everything becomes so much better because it's right in front of you and you will not miss anything. So those are some of the things that you can do. Those are some great tips for teens to help them stay organized and keep on top of everything that they have to do in a day. And I find personally, that those are tips that have helped me and that have helped my friends as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know that, Dr. Jane, a lot of kids in their teens, I know we were talking about this earlier, but many kids in their teens pick up smoking and vaping because um, sometimes they're under the impression that it's cool. So what are some of the harmful effects of these things? So I'm going to first talk about vaping because um, in the last some years, we have started seeing a shift from smoking cigarettes to vaping. And um, there's a huge, uh, there are many articles which are coming out now, which are telling what the vaping is doing these, to these little bodies. Um, you must have heard a couple of years back, we had the first death of um, because of vaping in teenagers. And so now these are getting much worse because what vaping does is, so vaping are little tiny cartridges. These have um, the, the substance which is inside them is oil-based. So the difference is when you are smoking, you smoke a cigarette and you 
take the smoke inside and you exhale it all out. Some part of it stays within your lungs. But when you are vaping, because of this oil-based thing, it actually sits down in your lungs because it is, it is oil-based. So it, it's heavier than the air and it stays down. And because the body doesn't recognize it, it produces inflammatory fluid. And so your alveoli which are the little tiny air sacs in the lungs they start getting inflamed and so and they don't exchange air very well and when they heal they heal by fibrosis what that means is that that the capacity of your lung to work starts decreasing and slowly and slowly your lungs don't work the way they normally should and over a period of time if you keep vaping the lungs stop working which is called respiratory failure and so those are the really bad things about vaping because you don't know what you're inhaling. One thing. Second thing is we don't know the long-term effects of these things. They could very well be carcinogenic. So the number of people who are going to start getting cancers will increase tremendously if you keep doing it because we don't know what these chemicals are made up of. We, nobody knows. Um, the, the, when, they, when they are marketing these chemicals, they can say, oh, it's better than the smoking, but nobody knows the long-term effects of this. So be very careful when you are smoking or when you are vaping especially because you don't know what, how much harm you are doing to your bodies. And, and especially, you know, you're addicting yourself, you're becoming nicotine addict, or you're becoming marijuana addict, and which later on will, will cause problems with the functioning of the brain. Also, forget about the lungs, your, your brain will not function the way it will function at the age of 30, 40, 50, if you keep on vaping and smoking, or, um, you know, smoking marijuana. So those are the things that we want to talk about when we are talking about vaping and smoking. It's really important that kids learn about this and talk about it at a young age so that when they're older, they can make choices that are informed and that are good and beneficial for themselves. So I think it's a very hot topic right now and it's good for kids to be informed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, kids are very smart people. If they know what harm these things will cause, I think many of you, will not make these choices. I feel like that. Yes, and when kids can be informed, then they can know about what harmful substances they're putting into their bodies and they'll be less likely to make these decisions that can actually harm themselves in the long run. Right. I would really like to touch upon COVID and kids. So what types of symptoms are there in kids? So currently, you know, more than a million kids in this country have tested positive for COVID. The numbers have, in, every week, the numbers are increasing. Um, in, and so I was just looking at the database recently from like, um, and from December 7th to December 13th, there have been so many more cases than, they, than we have seen a little bit before. So the numbers of the children testing positive is increasing every day. And what are the symptoms that we see mostly in children? We will see fever, we will see headaches, we will see a little bit of body aches, we are seeing vomiting, we are seeing diarrhea, we are seeing some kind of rashes. Some kids, very few kids who are really sick are presenting with every all of these things, plus some redness in the eyes. So these are the things which we are seeing. You should have you should you would have heard about this phenomena called the multi-system inflammatory disorder, which we have seen in kids only. Up till now, more than 300 uh, cases have been positive with this uh, disorder. It's like a disease which uh, used to be called Kawasaki disease. Basically, that disease uh, used to cause problem in small arteries. Similarly, we are seeing the multi-system inflammatory disorder, which is affecting the smaller arteries. The long-term effect will be some children will might have strokes. Some children might have some kind of cardiac problems going forward in their life. Um, there have been some reported deaths because of um, multi-system inflammatory and COVID also in children. Um, we Fortunately, we haven't lost so much kids because of COVID, but yes, the long-term effect will be um, associated with um, 
all the things which are associated with the small artery disorders. Um, so we will keep an eye on the children who have been much sicker than normal, and we'll see how they are going to progress as they grow, go forward in the years. Um, for now, the two big things we are stressing upon is the heart, the um, brain because of any kind of stroke kidneys because those are important because they are the small arteries so yes those are the big things that um, we are seeing in children i know that recently it seems as if so many people are getting really excited and optimistic that the vaccine is finally here and what can we expect about the vaccine? When will it be our turn? And would you advise kids to receive it? So right now in United States, we are giving vaccines to 16 and above and under the age of 16, children are not getting it. And um, I think the way it is, because number one, we don't have so much data on children. It has, not be, it has been tested on older people, but it has not been tested on children. And it's very difficult to test these new vaccines on children because um, children are very precious and you don't want to do all these to children without knowing what is going to be the long-term effect on them. So that's why most of the vaccination has been tested on, on older people. With that being said, um, the CDC and AAP is expecting that by the middle of next year or by August, November um, will be the time that most of the children will start getting the, will be vaccinated by that time. For now, it's only the adults who are getting the vaccine. And let's see how it happens with us. Like I have taken my first dosage of vaccine. I didn't have any problems and up till now. And then when I get my second dose, then I'll be able to see much better what is going to happen. But for now, um, I don't see any problem. We want to say that if 60% of the people are vaccinated, we have more chances of getting immunity to the rest of the population. So I think if not, if more symptoms don't happen to the older people, I think we will be safe in giving it to their younger children also, because um, we give flu vaccine to all the younger kids and they do very well. So I'm thinking that it will be on the same lines. And if the older people do well, then the children will do very well also because the children are more resilient. I, I know that a very uh, big topic right now is school reopening. So now that you were saying that by the middle of next year, we'll likely have most of the kids vaccinated. So when would you say it would be safe to reopen schools? I think if almost 40 to 60% of the people get vaccinated. Then next year by September, we might be able to open the schools for everybody. This is only my um, thinking, depending upon how we vaccinate and what is going to be the course of this disease going forward. Because if we can vaccinate, if we can take precautions, then at certain point, the, the virulence of this virus should start getting lower. And that is when we will be able to open our schools to everybody. How is it going to open? We have to take a call around that time, whether we are still going to do social distancing, whether we are still going to do masks, um, we have to see that. And one thing I want to say, even when we are taking the vaccine, we are still doing the social distancing, we are still wearing our mask because we do not know how big an immunity this vaccine is going to give it to us. But all we are saying is that if more of us vaccinate, then we have a better chance of opening the schools, opening the colleges, getting some kind of normancy into the society. That's very great to hear and it really, helps to bring an optimistic note into this very stressful time. I think year 2021 will be a better year, period. Because 2020 has gone through so much. So 2021 is going to be a better year because it is starting with something which is very hopeful. The whole year, 
all of us in the scientific community have talked about getting a vaccine, have talked about getting some kind of protection to the society, and it is already starting. So it is already, it's going to get better. It can't get worse from here. So I'm hoping that, you know, as and when this year unfolds, the new year, things will start to look better for everybody. Yes, I really hope so too. 2020 has been such a tragic year. And yes, I really hope that 2021 will look better. And I hope that's something that people can look forward to as we are in the final days of 2020. Yeah, that's true. That's true. We have to always be eternally optimistic. So Dr. Jane, is there any message you would like to give to the community? I want to say to the community, yes, this is a pandemic. Yes, be cautious. Live your life with your friends and family. Be safe, eat well, but be mindful of yourself and everybody else also. It's not a problem wearing a mask. We in healthcare are wearing a mask for 10 to 12 hours every day. If you go out into the public, wear your mask, wash your hands very well. Try to not do a lot of gatherings because that's where we are seeing the, uh, the uptake of the virus and the increase of viruses. This too shall pass like any other bad time. But if you are cautious, and a little bit careful around this time, you can beat it faster. Always remember, human mind is stronger than any virus. If we are just smart about it, we will be able to beat it. But don't be arrogant. Don't think that it's not going to happen to you because it can happen to you. And, and you might be that one unfortunate person who even though you are young and healthy and everything, doesn't get out of it. So don't take any chances. Um, be smart. That's what I would say. Thank you so much, Dr. Jane, for joining us today. This was very informative and very inspiring. And just some great tips for both parents and kids and teens on how they can really continue to live their life despite this time that we're all in right now. And I love that we ended on a hopeful note and that we all know that we're going to get through this, the solution is here, but it's just a matter of getting out the vaccine to people. So I'm just, um, thank you so much for joining us today. This was very, this was a really great session, very informative. And I know that uh, I know that people will really love to hear your inspiring words and this advice. Thank you, Meher. Thank you for interviewing me today and giving me this opportunity to talk to you and get my word out to the community. I'm so appreciative. And have a great day. And um, thank you so much. Thank you so much.